Porsche is known for fast sports cars, but you might be surprised to know that in 2022, four-door cars made up more than eight out of every 10 cars that Porsche sold. Yet 20 years earlier, it only sold two-door cars with cramped rear seats only suitable for small children. That fun Porsche you had in your 20s could be used in a pinch when the kids came along, but those kids grew and your Porsche became impractical. Customers fled to other car brands and many never returned. Porsche needed to change that. This is a story of Porsche's long and winding road to produce a four-door car. Although many Porsches have had four seats, most people wouldn't voluntarily climb in the back of them. This was always a problem for Porsche ever since they launched their first car, the 1948 Porsche 356. It was especially problematic across the Atlantic in the land of large cars. American car firm Studebaker reached out to partner with Porsche on a new engine, but it led to a stretched 356 dubbed the Type 530. Both the wheelbase and the front doors were stretched to allow easier access. Porsche weren't happy with the results, but kept working on the idea, renaming it Project 542, while at Studebaker it was known as the Z87. The four prototypes were delivered to Studebaker around 1953 to 1954, but by then the American car maker was in serious financial trouble, and this car was put on the back burner. Once Studebaker merged with Packard, it was evaluated by none other than John DeLorean, star of the movie Back to the Future. Hold on, that's not right. But to my mind, his car was the star of that film. DeLorean didn't see the potential in the car that by now looked hopelessly out of date, and all hopes of production disappeared. Porsche made various T7 designs starting in 1959. Early models would be based on the 356 and again stretched like the 1950s Studebaker project, this time with a wheelbase up to 30 centimeters longer to make it a true four-seater. As can be seen here, work on the 911 was being done at the same time, and the car clearly had 911 influences, and Porsche decided, probably rightly, to focus on that car to maintain its lead in the 2 plus 2 sports car market. The 911 bet proved to be the right one, and soon Porsche was thinking of making it longer. In 1969, they asked Pininfarina to extend it 19 centimeters as the 911 B17, also known as the Porsche 911 S Type 915. The project would continue for four years, producing the 35 centimeter longer C20 along the way. But again, Porsche decided not to bring it to production as it would provide unnecessary competition with the rest of their range, at least according to the Porsche Museum. To my mind, this doesn't make a lot of economic sense as it would only expand 911 sales to more customers. Throughout the 70s, Porsche focused on their core business, two-door sports cars, which was growing steadily. They tried new ventures such as a budget sports car with Volkswagen, the 914, but they avoided larger cars. The 928 launched in 1977 was a larger car, but it didn't provide any kind of rear seat comfort. That would change in 1984 when Porsche presented a specially modified four-seat 928S to company boss Ferry Porsche on his 75th birthday. It was stretched 25 centimeters with an extended rear roof to give more rear headroom. The Porsche 928 itself was a bit of a problem child. Initially intended to replace the 911, Porsche's luxury Grand Tourer hadn't gained the traction in the market that they wanted, so it's quite likely that this new version was more than just a birthday present. Porsche were looking at new ways of repurposing the 928 to get it selling, but the body didn't have enough rigidity for a production car, so this was another dead end. And this was becoming a bit of a problem. Sports cars were Porsche's thing, but it cost a lot more to make a car in the 1980s than it did in the 1940s when they designed the 356. Platform sharing to reduce extensive development costs was the order of the day, and niche companies like Porsche found themselves a little stuck. So they tried to expand the 928 chassis once more to reuse an existing platform to target a new market. The result was the 928H50, and work began at Porsche in 1986 with help from Detroit-based American Sunroof Company. This time the car would get clamshell Mazda RX-8-like rear doors that allowed easier rear access. It was either that or ridiculously long front doors that wouldn't work in tight parking spaces. Rear passengers would be wrapped in leather luxury with electronically reclining seats. 
but the rear wheel drive 928 still had a large transmission hump, so entering from the passenger side and sitting behind the driver was quite a challenge. The American Sunroof Company delivered the prototype to Porsche and so began 5,000 miles of testing. The 5 litre 330 horsepower V8 gave the car enough power, but the tests revealed a fatal flaw. Those clamshell doors meant Porsche had to remove the B pillar, the pillar between the front and rear doors. That meant that, like Porsche's previously lengthened 928, the chassis wasn't stiff enough. According to Porsche, the H50 concept limped along until 1989, but other sources put it as ending in 1987. Regardless, the H50 concept wasn't something that could be put into production. It was back to the drawing board. This must have been a big blow for Porsche. It looked like they needed a whole new platform to expand their range, but that required money that Porsche didn't have. It was a classic chicken and egg problem. But one of these things need to come first and Porsche needed money to stay in business. It was barely scraping a profit at this point. A new boss would shake things up and the development team got a shot in the arm thanks to the return of Ulrich Bez as the engineering boss and designer Harm LaHaye, both fresh from creating the pioneering BMW Z1 Roadster. By 1988 it was clear the 911 and 944 were the cars that sold well. The 928 had failed to gain traction. Yet the underpinnings of both the 911 and the 944 were getting long in the tooth. How could they revitalize Porsche's lineup and so save it from financial ruin? Porsche's bread and butter car, the 911, would get an update with the 993 model appearing in 1994. The 944 would be updated as the 968. Porsche would become lean and mean, drawing up an agreement with Toyota to learn lean manufacturing techniques. But Porsche needed to expand their range and they weren't going to expand fast by offering another expensive two-door sports car. So thoughts turned once more to a large four-door car. Ulrich Bez had come straight from BMW and knew the BMW M5 had a big fat profit margin. Why should BMW have all the fun? The project began in early 1990 as the Porsche 989, a family sports car. And being Porsche, the emphasis was on sports car, so it had to beat its family saloon competition. The BMW M5 had six cylinders, so Porsche decided to use a V8. But it wasn't going to use the V8 that powered the Porsche 928. Produced in limited amounts, it cost too much to produce. A new engine was out of the question. Cash Strap Porsche were already working on this new car and refreshing the rest of their range. So the 989 would use the 3.6 litre engine from the Audi V8 that would become the A8 in 1994, reputedly tweaked to produce 300 horsepower. It would grow to 4.2 litres and 350 horsepower. That would give the car a 0-60 time around 6 seconds with a top speed of 170 miles an hour. Not too bad for a family saloon. The team made the difficult decision to produce a new platform. Difficult because it meant pouring lots of money into the project, but as could be seen from previous efforts, their existing platforms worked as short sports cars but didn't like being stretched. Any excess structural mass was dead weight, which had been engineered out in the name of performance. The team evaluated putting the engine at the back, but this didn't give luxury car refinement, so it would be front-engined with rear-wheel drive. This time the transmission hump will be smaller than its predecessors to improve the rear passenger experience. Before the final platform was ready, the mechanicals were tested in a Mercedes W124 E-Class. An Audi engine in a Mercedes? This was heresy. As for styling, Harm LaHaye would produce a softer shape than the existing cars, reflecting the smooth designs of the time like the Vauxhall Opel Calibra. Harm joined too late to affect the shape of the 911 refresh, the 964 in 1989, but he'd used the same 989 cues on the 924-944 refresh, the 968 in 1991, and the new 911, the 993 in 1994. That's a lot of numbers. Relaxed US regulations meant that the heavy and expensive pop-up mechanism could be discarded, and the headlight design was borrowed from the homologated rally car, the 1986 Porsche 959. But Harm's three design studies for the 989 had some competition. Ital Design provided Porsche with their interpretation of a four-door Porsche, but Harm LaHaye's design study won out. With the 928, Porsche had attempted to move upmarket. That was the future. 
Porsche sold for a premium, in fact they had to to make a profit, customers demanded modern conveniences alongside the Germanic build quality, the 989 would follow this trajectory, delivering an interior that would rival BMW and Mercedes-Benz. Work continued through 1990 and by 1991 three full-scale models were built, but it was being developed as Porsche were facing tough times. Sales were down, so razor-thin profits took a serious hit. The vultures started circling, and BMW made an offer to buy the company. The estimated retail price for the new 989 was 150,000 Deutschmarks. In today's money, that's 50% higher than the current Panamera, not cheap. And to break even, Porsche had to sell 15,000 a year at a time when they were selling just 2,928s. After sinking 600 million Deutschmarks on developing the 989, Porsche had to decide whether to spend a lot more to produce it. It was time to go big or go home. Porsche made a decision in early 1992 to go home. It must have been a blow, but it was likely the right move. In the short term, it left Porsche limping along with an anemic lineup, but betting big on a car that could well have failed to sell could have ended Porsche as an independent company. It was too much for Ulrich Bears, who resigned shortly after, eventually moving to Daewoo. It also meant the exit of Porsche's CEO. Porsche would instead use those Toyota lean manufacturing lessons to recreate their 1970s strategy of a high and low end sports car vision, the Boxster and the new 996 version of the 911. This time Porsche controlled their own destiny and both cars would reuse as many Porsche owned components as possible to save money. This was a new Porsche where every component had to hit a price target to ensure each car made a profit. Porsche did create another four-door prototype in the 1990s, but not a car that you would expect. Since its inception, Porsche had been engineers for hire, so when the Chinese government came asking for a prototype family car, they started work on what would become the C88 that was shown in Beijing at the end of 1994. There wasn't a Porsche badge to be seen on the car at all. Instead, there was a triangle with three dots to signify the family, mother, father, and one child. This was, of course, the era of China's one-child policy, and it featured just one child seat. C stood for China, while eight is a lucky number in Asia. It wasn't lucky for Porsche or any other company that answered the Chinese government's tender, as none were taken forward to production. Porsche tried to sell the concept in India, but the concept remained only a concept. Daimler also answered the Chinese government's call, producing the FCC, a forerunner of the Mercedes A-Class. The first production Porsche to have four doors was a bit of a departure for the sports car manufacturer. It was clear in the 1990s that customers were excited about SUVs and crossovers with the success of cars such as the BMW X5. With Porsche having long ties to the Volkswagen Group, they once again joined a group project to build a four-door SUV platform that would be sold as the Volkswagen Touareg, Audi Q7, and of course, the 2002 Porsche Cayenne. It was a bit of a gamble though. Would customers accept that this big family car was worthy of Porsche's sports car heritage? They needn't have worried. If anyone could make a performance SUV or crossover, it was Porsche. The Cayenne Turbo's 4.5 litre V8 delivered 444 horsepower. Even the non-turbo model got to 60 in 6.4 seconds. But that didn't mean Porsche had given up on the idea of a four-door saloon. With a healthy bank balance, Porsche produced the Meteor, Phantom and Mirage concepts in the early 2000s and used elements from each design to make the 2009 Porsche Panamera. Porsche didn't show off a concept of the Panamera before launch, that was probably for the best. They didn't really want to frighten small children necessarily. The rumors are that the ugliness of the Panamera shape was stemmed from Volkswagen insisting that rear passengers needed more headroom and the boot needed to be bigger. It was around this time Volkswagen were working to fold Porsche into their vast empire. So Porsche complied, producing a shape that shocked in 2009 when it launched, but like many shocking designs, is now accepted. With customers favoring SUVs and crossovers, Panamera sales have done just okay. Porsche claims it wasn't expecting sales of more than 20,000 a year, and so from that perspective it's met its goal. But as the first generation didn't share its platform with any other car, it can't have made a large profit. 
the second generation switched to share the platform of the Bentley Continental and Flying Spur, also part of the Volkswagen Group. When asked by the press about the 989 project, Porsche said that the prototypes had been crushed and no photographs existed, but soon rumours swirled that the prototype was still somewhere in storage. After the Panamera launched, Porsche felt safe enough to show it off at their museum, now that it wouldn't cause unfair comparisons between Porsche's official four-seat saloon. In 1988, when the 989 was in development, Porsche sold around 31,000 cars. In 2022, they sold almost 10 times that, but it wasn't the Panamera that drove those sales, it was their sporty cars on stilts, the Macan and the Cayenne. That's what customers with money wanted, a practical car with a badge to show that they've arrived. It might have sports car muscle, but it was wasted on the school run. But it meant Porsche got to stay in business and keep making serious sports cars. The Porsche 989 might not have been the car that kept Porsche alive, or even the Panamera, but it showed that Porsche were right to bet on four doors. The Cayenne might have been a successful Volkswagen joint project, but the 1970s Porsche 914 had a lot of problems. Check out its story on the right. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.